our computing is slowly diffusing out into our environment. And for the most part, apart from a few conferences where the great and the good are congregated to talk about this sort of stuff, it's happening quietly behind the scenes. But everyday objects are already getting smarter. And in 10 years' time, everything, every piece of clothing you have, every piece of jewelry you wear, everything you carry with you will be smart. It'll be calculating, measuring, and weighing your life. In 10 years' time, the world, your world, is going to be full of sensors. And you haven't really seen anything yet. So this is closer to the end of the vision. This, is, this powder-sized chip, um, and that's a salt crystal, so this is a small thing, is something called the Mu chip from Hitachi. It's the smallest commercially available RFID system in the world and can be pulse powered by radio waves. It doesn't require a battery. You can literally scatter this stuff like dust or embed it into a sheet of paper. And you know what the really interesting thing about this technology is? This was commercially released 10 years ago. So the inevitability of smart dust. So what is smart dust? Well, smart dust, of course, isn't a new concept. It's the originated with DARPA back in the 90s. And it's general purpose computing, sensors, wireless network, networking, all bundled up into millimeter scale sensor modes, drifting in the air currents, flecks of computing power settling on your skin, ingested, monitoring you inside and out. And if you don't think that's possible, this is the Michigan micro mode. It's a cubic millimeter in size. And uh, in deference to the speaker before, yes, it runs an ARM processor. Um, it's a tiny computer, and it features data pro uh, processing, data storage, wireless comms, and it's probably as close to the true smart dust vision from the early DARPA days as we've come so far. They're designed to harvest energy from the environment around them and to communicate via mesh network. And so think tiny solar cells for power. And although that's not the only route, there are a whole bunch of other passive energy generation te techniques, like vibration harvesting, for instance, have already been scaled down quite nicely. And the sort of minute amounts of energy they generate are actually quite well suited to the minute amount of power that this sort of thing needs. Um, and of course, at least for medical or, or bio use, the, the body heat is another obvious potential energy source after how much sunlight are you going to get and inside an intracranial bleed. And more important, this is actually something that really excited me at the tail end of the year. This is a, a prototype of an ambient backscatter device, and it's from a team at the University of Washington. They're using existing TV and uh, cell transmissions, ambient RF energy, effectively, that's already in the air, air around us, not just to power the devices, but also as the communication medium by reflecting or absorbing the pre-existing radio signals. So unlike NFC, where power is supplied by a reader, here, neither the reader nor the transmitter are powered. Both devices are battery free. And while the data rates are fairly low, as you might imagine, they're communicating much higher rates than NFC is, uh, is capable of, with reliable transmission maybe a couple of feet. And that's pretty impressive, especially for something that's still an academic project. And you can imagine embedding this sort of technology inside concrete walls, for instance. And the immediate question is, well, wait, will, will it actually get the radio waves inside concrete walls? Well, do you still have a cell signal in here? If so, then yes. You can embed these into walls as the buildings are put up. So it's going to be a true smart building at that point. When we think about big data, almost inevitably, the amount of data that the Internet of Things, let alone any conceived smart dust revolution is going to bring us, will generate a vast amount of data that will, that, that will exceed anything that can be filtered and distilled into a remote database. The phrase data exhaust will no longer be a figure of speech. It will literally be a statement. Your data will exist in a cloud, a halo of devices surrounding you. It has to provide you with, with centered computer support as you walk along, calculating constantly, consulting one another, predicting, anticipating your needs. You'll be surrounded by a web of distributed sensors, computing, and data, and hopefully won't actually need all the clunky UI things that we've become used to ourselves mechanical Turks inside our own software. Worse yet, we've made ourselves mechanical Turks inside other people's software, which is a fundamental architecture problem, although that's a whole different talk that possibly some of you in the audience might have heard already. Um, and there are two ways that this could go, and don't make the mistake in thinking the decisions we're making today with the Internet of Things aren't going to affect that. 
Will the architectures for smart dust works in a peer-to-peer -peer manner to make computing power and sensing available to individuals? Or whether the network architectures will centralize command and control into a few hands? The only real question is who will have access to sensors, the computing power, and to the data that is generated? Personally, for one, I, I don't want a world where the Google smart dust and the Microsoft smart dust are having a battle for my temperature reading on my skin. The diffusion of computing into the environment will mean not just the computing is always available, but also the computing offers the possibilities of continuous monitoring and surveillance. This is the promise of the IoT. It's the threat of the IoT. And we have to think carefully about the architectures we're putting together for these sort of, these sort of things now, because we will go there no matter what we decide, one way or the other. So Julie Steele, uh, a good friend of mine who's the person that pointed me towards these postcards, actually had something pretty smart to say about them. Sometimes you can predict the what even if you don't know the how. And after all, those Germans managed to predict Amazon. That's the shops coming to you. So computing is evolving constantly. Mainframes to desktops, to laptops, to cell phones, to your bloodstream, to literally blowing in the wind around you. And I guess the takeaway from this talk is that the things we're building now, today, and talking about here at MakerCon and, and the other conferences are, are basic building blocks, blueprints, if you like. Essentially, forerunners of the smart dust we're going to be living with 10 or 20 or maybe a bit longer down the road. And the architectural choices we're making today to build the Internet of Things are fundamentally going to affect the way those endpoint devices, the mature technology, looks. And I'm scared about the way we're making some of those architectural choices about the Internet of Things. So if you're a startup building Internet of Things things, or if you're a bigger corporation, if you are one of those huge consolidated conglomerates of huge corporations, Sit back, think about the sort of world you want to live in, because the choices you're making are going to change the world. And right now, as far as I'm concerned, the Internet of Things people, and I include myself here because I do a bunch of Internet of Things things, aren't making good choices. But again, that's a whole nother talk. So I want you to think about the kinds of information we approximate, guess at, or determine by polling and sampling, and then making a calculation. In the future, we won't have to calculate things. We can just measure them, because the sensors will be everywhere. And if you can measure something, you can change it. And very soon, you'll be able to change just about everything. 